when we were younger, we wanted to do something significant, something important, uh, something where people would look up to you or even we kind of think like make some money. Uh, if you ask a lot of teenagers or even uh, young kids, like what do you want to do when you grow up or what, what do you think your purpose in life is or whatever, a lot of times they kind of lead with, I want to make a lot of money. Now, for me, when I was like in grade school, kind of that fourth, fifth grade kind of time, I wanted to do one of three things. I really wanted to be a firefighter. Now, one of the main reasons for that, I was exposed at a young age to the movie Backdraft, and I saw this movie, and I was like, that is what I want to do. I want to run in to a fire, and I want to save people. I want to do all that. I thought that was like the greatest thing in the world uh, so even now, I still think it's super cool. It's like superheroes, just this amazing job. Uh, but then I thought, well, if I didn't do that, I want to be a police officer. That's what I want to do. I want to serve the community, love the community, and protect the community from bad people or bad guys. And so I really thought, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Well, when I got in about sixth grade, I was actually pretty tall for my age. And then as I got older, everyone started to pass me up. But I thought for sure I was going to go pro uh, in basketball. I'd started to develop some pretty decent basketball skills. And I thought for sure I would be in the NBA. So I would be doodling in class as the teacher's talking. I would always draw like an NBA draft board. I would be the first pick of the draft. And I would also draw me as an NBA player, clearly someone that had a lot of muscles and a jersey. I was drafted by the Chicago Bulls. I would be number 24 because I thought I would be a step above Michael Jordan, number 23. And I just had this all mapped out for me. I didn't start coming to church, but more importantly than just going to church, but finding about who God was until I was in high school. And the more I found out about who God is and what he's done in my life, I realized that I really didn't want to necessarily do a job. I really just wanted to follow him. Now, far too often when we think about our purpose or maybe even our calling in our life, honestly, we typically lean to what I'm going to do or my job or my career. And in my high school year, my, my senior year, excuse me, of my high school career, um, right before I graduated, my mom was asking me, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And at that time, I had a 1989 Ford Festiva. It was a car that felt like this big. And I told her, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I know I just want to continue following God. And whether I drive that car for another five years, 10 years, 20 years, I'm just committed to following him. For you, whatever happened to your dreams or to your hopes about your purpose, um, whatever happened to that calling was more than just picking a career for you. What if instead of thinking that your career or a job or your purpose or, or anything like that is not so much out there in the world, but really found in here in God's word. And I truly believe with all that I am that your purpose and your calling in life is actually found here and not so much out there. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to do something a little bit different than my like teaching norm. I usually like to hang out in a passage or a paragraph and really kind of dissect it and really see like, what is God saying here? We're actually gonna look in three different places in scripture because I believe the Bible is so interwoven and it's so connected that we can, we can look at this topical idea of calling and purpose and see it interwoven throughout the scriptures. So today, we're going to look at the lavish gift of calling and purpose. So where do we begin? We're actually going to begin in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. And we're, not going to, we're actually going to start in the very first chapter of Genesis, not some other random chapter. We're going to begin in chapter 1 of Genesis. So what's happening here in this chapter is God is speaking the world into existence. And after each day he spoke something into existence, he would say, it is good. 
In verse 27 is when he speaks man into existence. He speaks humankind into existence. And he says, it is very good. In verse 28, this is what he says. He says, and God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what is God's purpose for mankind is to be fruitful and multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. God doesn't say, all right, get to work. (laughs) He doesn't say, figure it out. He doesn't say, do good things. He actually begins with a blessing. God blessed them. Verse 27, he creates them and then he blesses them. God could have stopped there. He could have made them, blessed them, and just go, all right, you can just exist in this place. But no, God doesn't do that. He doesn't want us just to exist in this world. He did not want Adam and Eve just to exist in the Garden of Eden. He has a purpose for them. And he actually gives them kind of two jobs, like two purposes, like the reason why they exist. The first is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. To be fruitful here means have children. Now there's other places in scripture that when this word fruitful comes out, does not mean have children. But in this context, in verse 27, it means to have children. But he, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. But here's the thing. They were perfectly created and crafted for this job. The second thing he says is have dominion. Have dominion means to rule. It means to rule. It, 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 God delegated his authority to mankind for his creation. When again, God could have just kind of said, just exist, you just do your thing, just kind of figure it out. But no, that's not what God does. God has a plan and a purpose for humans. And, and when uh, have dominion, not, it, it's not to rule with an iron fist. It's, it's not to like um, be mean or, or, or to be um, not to give grace. Actually, what it really means is to tend to is to care, is to love, to to rule over, to be there. Here's the thing, God could have done this again all on his own, but he has a plan and a purpose for humans. And from the very beginning, we see something unique about mankind's purpose is to represent God in this world. That's their purpose, to represent God in this world to be a caretaker, to bear not just God's image, but his responsibility. Humans were created with and for a purpose. But I believe that too many of us, we just kind of exist, don't we? I mean, just think about it. On a Monday, typical Monday for generalizing statement here, but typically on Monday, we get up and we get ready for work. And let's say you go to work at eight o'clock in the morning. So you get up at seven, you get ready for the day, maybe eat some breakfast and you head on to work. And then you work from, maybe you have an eight to five kind of job. And at five o'clock, the, the bell rings, you can leave. And so you go back home and you go home. Maybe when you get home, you have to cook dinner or, or whatever. And so you, you eat, you kind of hang out with your family. And then you sit down in front of a TV for the next hour and a half to two hours. Then you realize it's getting late. I need to head off to bed. And we go to bed and we wake up the next day. It's the same thing again. If you're a, a middle school or high school student on a Monday, you wake up about the same time, about seven in the morning, get ready for the day. Eight o'clock, typically you need to be at school and you're at school to about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And maybe you have, uh, maybe you're involved in sports or FFA or something. And so you have some extracurricular type events or things that you're a part of, but then you get home, you eat dinner, You sit in front of the TV or on YouTube or on TikTok or whatever, and you just kind of waste some time there. And then you go to bed and you wake up and the next day begins the same. And we just kind of exist in this life, but we are created with a purpose in mind. 
What would it look like if you chose to pursue his purpose for your life instead of just finding a career or finding a job and what he has for you? What blessing could you be potentially missing out on that you're so unaware of? But God doesn't just give a purpose. He also has a calling or even better said, a commission for your life. What is that? It's to make disciples. It's to make disciples. We're gonna jump almost a little past halfway through the Bible to this book called Matthew. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament and chapter 28 is where we'll be at. Now, what's happened at this point in scripture is that Jesus came, he's Emmanuel, he's God with us, and he lives this perfect life. And he does not just miracles, but he does this amazing teaching that's so in-depth and so loving and gives so much grace. And he does all of these things, but then he's accused of a crime. And, and eventually he is nailed to a cross and he dies. And three days later, he, he comes back from the grave and he's hanging out with his friends for about 40 more days and teaching them again and just loving on them and uh, uh, just being present in their life. And right before he ascends up to heaven in chapter 28, this is what he says to his disciples. It says in verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To the end of the age. Because of Jesus's authority, he tells them to do something. He says, go. He says, go. This word go here means one of two things. Means to leave, but it really means to make an actionable step. Now, in the past, at the very least, 12 months, I want to say it's more than that, probably actually closer to 18 months, we've really been kind of as a church, as a church leadership, we've really kind of been pushing this idea of this BLESS rhythm. Now, BLESS is an acronym, which B stands for begin with prayer. L is to listen. E means to eat, which is really about building relationship with those around us. S is to serve, and the last S is to share. Is to leave, or or excuse me, is to live this blessed rhythm in your life to those around you. Um, Also, this go could also mean to go reach un. Uh, unreached people groups for Jesus, like what we've done with the Kroon people and partnering with other missionaries around the world. Um, it, it, it's also this idea, it could be Cambodia or your local school, but to go and make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples. Disciples are made because the investment of other believers That's how they're made. That is how the gospel is is, is sent. That's how how the gospel changes lives is through believers. I didn't, again, and I've I've said this um, multiple times um, when I've taught, I didn't grow up in a church environment. And a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go to church. I was a freshman or sophomore in high school. And I was really kind of leery and hesitant to go. And he said, you know, there's girls there. And I was like, all right, I'm in. And um, so I went to church. And I went to church just because my friend had asked me, but I started to kind of um, like what I was hearing about God, about Jesus, and about not just what he has done, but what he's still doing in my life. And I remember it was a summer camp and I, I chose to put my faith and trust in who he was. And shortly thereafter, and who he is, shortly thereafter, I met with the pastor of the church that I attended. His name was Brent. And I just kind of was talking to him and felt like I'm just supposed to follow God. And I don't know what that means. I'm just going to place my hope and trust in who he is. And so Brent then started to meet with me on Mondays, every Mondays, and we read through the book of John together. 
and I would ask him questions and he would ask me questions. And it was kind of like this, this kind of this blessed rhythm that was happening. And I remember as I began to get older and have a family of my own and started to really be involved in student ministry, I remember thinking at a young age, at 22, 23 years old, that this is the type of life that I want to lead, is to make disciples in my home as well as in my ministry and meeting with students and encouraging them and reading through the book of John and even the book of James together. And it's so fun that when you can kind of look back, kind of take a step back and see what God is doing and, and, and kind of this like uh, second generation that happens. Uh, my son, Logan, my oldest son, Logan, is in college. And this summer, he started to um, really take massive steps in his faith in leading well. Uh, one of his close friends, his name is Brendan uh, started to come to church about a year, year and a half ago. And Brendan saw some things in my son, Logan, that he wanted to know more about. He wanted to know more about this Jesus. He wanted to know more about this Bible. And, and, and he saw Logan as someone who's honest, someone who, who would meet him where he's at and just be authentic. And so they started to meet every week and work through the Bible together. And when Logan didn't know the answer, he would come to me and ask me a question. And even if I didn't know the answer, we would kind of work on it together. And it was just this fun thing that my son, my teenage son was leading another teenager and knowing who this Jesus is. I think there's an important principle here that we often miss. The commission, this great commission or, or this command to go, this, this purpose in our life, this calling isn't just for professional Christians, people that are paid to work in a church or elders in a church or some form of church leadership is, is those are the ones that make disciples. No, this calling, this commission is for everyone. Everyone is, is to go and make disciples. Any given week here at Family Church, including online, we have uh, anywhere from five to 600 people who attend our services every week, which is awesome. And it's amazing to see God really growing this body of believers. But what would it look like if next year, if we continue this trend, another 50 people start coming, which is great, or start logging on, which is awesome. But how different would it be if each of us, 500 to 600 of us, started making disciples in our sphere of influence, how different this church would look. No longer would it be an additional mindset. It would really be about multiplication because each of us have this charge to go and make disciples. There's one thing that often gets overlooked is verse 20. Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always to the very or to the end of the age. You see, calling isn't based on what you do. It's really founded in who Jesus is. And what I love about this, he's always with us. If you place your hope and trust in who he is, the Holy Spirit has made his home in you and he is with you always always. So it's not just you. It's you and God that's working together because we need to give a hope for the answer that is in us. We need to be ready in season and out of season. And I think there's plenty of us, or, or excuse me, plenty of times where each of us have kind of missed the mark a bit. Um, we had an opportunity, but we didn't step through it. Um, or, or maybe we just kind of held our tongue when we had a potential chance. Or, and so we kind of look back and be like, ah, I've missed that opportunity. But instead of looking at all the opportunities lost, maybe look forward. Who is in your sphere of influence? Some of you connect with, whether at work or at school or even at the grocery store, that you can start making a disciple. Here's the thing. Even though we're each called to make disciples, we all have a unique gifting and calling in, inside of that because we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. 
Now we're gonna jump to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is wrote by a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is writing to this early group of Christians to encourage them in their faith. In chapter two, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. This word here, workmanship, in Greek is poema, which means work of art. You are God's work of art. You are skilled and crafted to work with him in your sphere of influence. We are created with a unique plan to serve with him. I love this. We are created in Christ Jesus. It's not through our old nature we do this. It's through this new creation that he gives. I feel like the last three or four times I've been able to share, I, I kind of end up talking about this sanctification that happens, that who I am today is not who I'm going to be in five years. And who I am today is not who I was five years ago, that I'm continually being changed. It's the already but not yet type of grace that is happening. We are created in Christ. God created the world by speaking it into, an exist, into existence. And much of the same way, he does that with this new creation in us. I love this. We are created for good works. We're created for good works. Good works don't happen outside of the new creation. It just doesn't. That's just called works. We're going to work our way up to God. That's what that is. That is just works. But good works uh, uh, isn't salvation, but it's a result of salvation. But people believe they can work their way up to God. But the reality is, it has nothing to do with them. Again, it has everything to do with Jesus, that this salvation is a free gift. And because of this gift, we can see ourselves with a divine purpose, that we have this, uh, uh, this calling, this commission to make disciples with our unique calling. Now, one thing that's very interesting with these three verses or passages, excuse me, and how they're so interwoven is in each of those places, in each in Genesis uh, chapter one, in Matthew chapter 28, in Ephesians chapter two, we see God's presence through it all. We saw that at the very beginning that God blessed. We saw that Jesus is with us to the very end. And now we see that uh, uh, God prepared beforehand, that, that he has been intimately involved with all of this. What do I take away from that? It's not required for you to do it on your own. You have the creator of the world that is intricately involved, intimately involved in this process of this gift of calling and purpose. Guys, have a great week. I'm gonna hand off to the campus pastors. We'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, thanks so much for sticking around just for a few more minutes. Um, as we're kind of looking through this series, the past six weeks, I wanna show you all the gifts that God so freely gives us. He gives us the gift of grace, the gift of love and of adoption, the gift of righteousness, the gift of church community, and the gift of calling and purpose and remember, he lavishly, he gives us all of these gifts. And it, it reminds me, just to kind of reflect back on it, is we have such a good God who gives good gifts. And so kind of the transformational moment I have is not so much of what we just went over. It has more to do with what we've walked through the past six weeks. The first question is this, which gift are you most grateful for? Which of these gifts are you most grateful for? For me, I'm most grateful for the gift of grace. If it wasn't for grace, my life would be a mess. So for me, 
The gift of grace is the, the gift that, that I'm most grateful for. The next question is this, is how are you experiencing that gift in your life? For me, how am I experiencing the gift of grace in my life? I've realized something. Once I've received grace, I can be able to give grace more freely. So for you, how are you experiencing that gift in your life? Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we had a chance just to be together, uh, to hang out a bit, but also to really lean into the gift of calling and purpose, that each of us have a calling, each of us have a purpose, and each of us also have a unique way of serving you or serving with you um, in that calling and in that purpose. So God, I pray that you will show up in each of our lives this week, that we can look back and say, it's because you did this, that I know that you were present, that you were there. Help us to begin to live this blessed rhythm in our everyday life, that we can go and make disciples. Give us the boldness, the encouragement to, uh, uh, to move away from maybe past uh, stumblings or past mistakes that you have called us and you will be with us to the very end. So God, thank you for you and your goodness. In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. Guys, again, have a great week. And uh, I know we're getting close to Christmas. Uh, have a Merry Christmas. Bye, guys.